And tonight we have the special program, a collector's show and tell, and you're going to hear from eight different collectors. They each have three minutes, and I was just warning them that I'm very strict on time, so that three minutes should should be adhered to. <laughs> and then after each of them speak, we'll have two minutes open up for you, the audience, to ask a question. You're welcome to throw something into the chat. You're also welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question. We'll kind of try to stick with that two minute formula so we can move on to the next person. And then at the end of the eight collectors, we'll have everybody um, welcome to, you know, to jump in then and ask questions again through the chat or by unmuting yourself. So to start off the evening, I'm going to hand it over to Evan. Evan, are you there? Yes, I am here. All right. Welcome, Evan. Thank so you. you will be our, our first collector. You're going to have three minutes on the clock. And uh, you can talk about your work. And then we'll try the two-minute question after, after you speak. Sound good? Great. I'm starting my stopwatch so that I can track the time. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much both to um, our um, my fellow collectors and also to um, people who have signed in to, to watch. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here. And we'll talk uh, more about future events at the end. But I'm going to start right in on my work. Um, I thought that I would talk about something that maybe had some relevance to the moment, which uh, we find ourselves being so continually online that that we're that we're engaging with a virtual world in a way that we haven't um, before. And a number of years ago, I was doing a portfolio review, and I met an artist named Susan E. Evans, and she had this project that I just loved. Um, where she engaged with something called Second Life. And Second Life, if you don't know, um, is an online world that was launched in 2003. Um, and it's similar to massively multiplayer online role-playing games, but it's not a game. It has no manufactured conflict, no set objective. The virtual world can be accessed freely in a variety of ways. And you set... Um, the persona that you will uh, walk around in this virtual world via uh, an, what they call an avatar. And so she recognized that these, in quotes, people who were populating this world as their avatars um, existed in a way that couldn't really be photographed. And so she was curious to present them as real people you um, know, in, in, in a way that would render them somehow more real to us. And so she, she went to an antique process called Ambrotype, um, which I'm not going to use my time to, dis to explain. But she used the light of the computer screen as her light source and set up a medium format camera to make a wet collodion plate uh, exposure of the Second Life avatars. And so what ended up was this kind of small object. And amber types usually to be seen well are, are set on either black velvet or coated on the back with some sort of uh, opaque black um, uh, substance. Um, so they're not always easy to see. I have another one. And Susan really struggled to figure out how to display these because she didn't want them to be seen as antiquarian objects, even though that she was using an antiquarian process. And so she called me up because I'd expressed such interest in it. And we worked through for months how she could actually show this work. And, um, and she never figured it out. Um, and so finally she gave up and she sent me a few of these plates as a gift for trying to help her. And so I just thought that it was kind of a bittersweet um, metaphor for um, all of the kind of projects that people are trying to do during COVID and living virtually and living through an online presence. And, and so I see that I'm three minutes 40, so I'll stop there. 
Perfect. So we're going to open up to questions. If someone is brave, you can take a moment and unmute yourself, or you can throw something into the chat. And if we don't get anything, we'll move on to the next one. And you can no, say nothing on chat so far. Uh, so Evan, did the avatars pose for the pictures? I believe was it yes. a photo session. I believe it was. I believe it was the equivalent of a traveling. 19th century tintype photographer studio online with a computer screen and a medium format uh, wet collodion box. How many of these do you have? Two. The two I showed. And how many does she have? I don't know. I think that uh, the last I checked, which was a few months ago, I think she's not making art anymore. So it's, um, uh, she never, she never showed them. I know that she never showed them. She, um, everything that we came up with as an option for how she would be happy to present them in the world, um, she, she wasn't happy with it. And I guess the other question I would have is, does she have a picture of the real people? I think not. No, <laughs> I think the whole point was that this was the full representation of, of, yeah. of, of that person. So cool. Uh, how would something on the right be generated? I don't know enough about Second Life to know how people create their avatar. I don't know whether one has a toolbar where you can add, you know, wings or teeth or hair or something, whether it's from a palette like in Photoshop, or whether you have to have some kind of drawing skills or, or design skills. I, I really don't know the answer to that. And Evan I mean, but, in, but in fact, the image on the right is no more or less constructed than the image on the left. Just because the image on the left is more normal doesn't mean that it is actually more representative, representative of, of, of some actual thing. Perfect. We're going to stop there. And then Evan, we have a question from Virginia in the chat about what she's doing now. But I, maybe don't know. I don't know. Her, yeah, she's, she's kind of fallen off the radar. I think her, a few years ago, her website still had a lot of content and, and now it doesn't. So I think that she's moved on to other things. By any chance is one of these her personal avatar? I don't think so. I think that, uh, uh, I don't know definitively, but she never presented it to me as something that she had been a part of and, and, and wanted to display herself. I think she was interested in it um, intellectually and photographically. Excuse me, but they're pretty good exposures taken from a screenshot, especially on an amber type plate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, we're going to move on to Fred. Fred, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. All right, we'll open it up to your slide, and you've got three minutes on the clock. Go for it. Okay, so um, this is obviously a picture of me, so I've kind of blown the punchline right away. Uh, this is a picture of me in 1974 when I was a, uh, a student at Oberlin College where Walker Evans, in the last year of his life, was invited to come and do a residency. And because I was interested in photography, I was one of a group that tagged around, tagged along with Walker Evans. And he was really very old and quite sick. And... Um, uh, wasn't able to handle a regular camera and was basically messing around with an S SX-70 and just popping off shots of everything. Uh, and he was followed around by studio assistants who would dutifully collect every SX-70 and catalog it and file it away. And um, uh, now I'll have to tell you that I had a terrible attitude about the whole experience. Um, if any of you have read much about Walker Evans, you probably know that he sort of has a legendarily difficult personality. And, uh, and you add that to him being old and sick, and he was really pr very cranky and um, um, uh, a little difficult. Uh, so, you know, at, uh, at any rate, um, many years passed, my interest, my memory of that whole experience went away. And, you know, I'll have to say at the time, 
Walker Evans was uncool, right? You know, he was vintage, you know, I was interested in William Eggleston or Stephen Shore, you know, uh, so, uh, uh, many years went by and I've totally forgot about the whole thing until my uh, brother Googled me and discovered that there were uh, SX 70s of me in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, uh, so Walker Evans's personal collection all went to the Met and were duly cataloged. And I thought like, wow, that's amazing. I'm in the Met, you know. Uh, and then I, and so I tell my wife and she says, yeah, wow, you know, that looks a lot like that picture that's in the shoebox in the closet. Uh, and I, sure enough, go to the closet and there is this. Uh, the, the best of the series that Walker gave to me, I completely forgot about it. So, and of course, naturally, um, not stored in the high security video surveilled humidity controlled um, uh, uh, locker where the rest of my collection is this was in a shoebox so this is a moral of the moral of this story is collections are all the value of your collections all relative your taste changes over time i'm smart enough now i've took me a took me 30, 40 years to realize Walker Evans was a genius. Um, now, I'm not sure that um, this was his best work, but still it was uh, nice to be in his halo. So, um, uh, so that's my story. Perfect, thank you, Fred. All right, we've got questions from the audience. I see in the chat, people are asking, yes, this is an SX-70. Um, and I'll have to say, even stored in a shoebox for 30 years, um, it's held up pretty well. Um, don't take this uh, the wrong way, Fred, but has anybody noted your passing uh, resemblance to early Andy Warhol um, uh, Polaroids? <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of a, that's pure coincidence, you know, <laughs> the, um, uh, my hair is a little, uh, not quite as crazy as, uh, Andy. That, so. that, is that is true. Oh, do you remember why you saved it? I mean, he handed it to you and then you just put it in a folder somewhere? You know, I, uh, I just, I guess I just saved it because, you know, I thought, well, you know. Uh, there it is with all the other snapshots that I'll never look at again, you know. Um, so, I mean, I guess, thank God I was smart enough to do that. So if you didn't admire him at the time, what were you doing there? Was it just because he was famous or, or was there another reason? Uh, yeah, I think it was just because he was famous and... Um, uh, and uh, kind of my advisor told me, you ought to do this. So, right. you know, so <laughs> I was obediently, uh, I followed his advice. Nice. Perfect. Thank you, Fred. All right. We're going to move on to Ellen. Ellen, are you ready? I am. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. And thank you, Evan. Thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, you want to put, there it is. So um, my collection of photography is, it's part of a, a collection of contemporary art. I'm really not a student of photography uh, and I don't primarily collect photography, but um, it's certainly works that have drawn me in have oftentimes been photographed. So I have several photographs that, that are, are very meaningful. When asked to pick one, I picked this one because I felt that um, there was a particular connection with this piece. Visually, I was drawn to this piece and was also drawn when I understood more about the artist. Um, I, was, I had the privilege of meeting Karen Simons um, on a trip with the Carnegie in 2008 when she had an exhibition at the Tate Modern called A Living Man Declared Dead and Other Chapters, where she recorded detailed bloodlines of different groups around the world with incredible thought and detail and precision and created these 
powerful narratives. I actually have this book, which is from that exhibit, which I don't know if you can see, but it's quite large. Um, and then she was um, also in the 2013 Carnegie International with a project called Birds of West Indies, which photographed James Bond women through the years, along with weapons and vehicles and birds that appear in James Bond film. Um, and it, it was really, she's a photographer, but she also works with text and performance and graphic design. And one of the, um, when I had an opportunity to acquire this piece, it, it really spoke to me. It, it, I felt that it was a very simple image that was able to convey a very powerful um, story. And, and that's what drew me to it. This is part of a series that she calls um, the Black Square series. It's an ongoing series where I think she may even be working, you know, continuing to contribute to this to this day. She collects objects and documents and individuals and places them in, within this black field that has the precise, precisely the same measurements as Malevich's 1915, 1915 work of the same name, which is often cited as one of the seminal works in modern art. Um, what the, what's represented here is blue buckets, which were mounted on civilian vehicles in Moscow to protest the misuse of emergency rotating lights by VIPs and oligarchs and celebrity and businessmen and officials so that they could bypass Moscow traffic where other people had to sit in it. Um, so her ability to, to, again, with a simple image, to tell a complex story with a powerful message is something that, that really spoke to me. And um, having been able to meet the artist and understand a little bit more about her intention is something that I, I look to do when I look to collect any work. I'm not often as fortunate to be able to meet the artist, but um, it's important to me to understand what they're trying to convey. Um, and it's hanging on the wall behind me. And so during this COVID time, we're very privileged to be able to surround ourselves with some of the art that we've acquired. And again, thank you if you have any questions. Perfect, thanks, Ellen. Um, so sure. we'll open it up to, to questions from the audience if you guys wanna jump in. And again, you can throw something in the chat or if you're feeling brave, unmute yourself. Ellen, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um, I mean, I, I've, I, I've always been attracted to Taryn's work and um, I find her work to be in a category that I call a Lay's potato chip. It's really hard to buy just one. Um, right. and, and, and I wonder how you picked. Well, there were three works in this series that were available at the time. Um, it, one was in Johannesburg. It was a, a, a fire series. I cannot remember the third in this one. And I think maybe the quietness of the image. Um, it's interesting. There's an, another image behind me, which I know a lot less about, an artist, Jorge Maki, and it happens to be a match. And I think around the same time, we had a lot of fire images in our collection. So I was drawn to maybe one. Um, but it was the opportunity to have this. Um, but as you said, she's, she's just this very thoughtful, deep, intense, uh, and beautiful person, both inside and out. Um, so there's a new question. Further thoughts on the Bloodline series, uh, Christine asks. Did you find the amount of background information sufficient in the book or the exhibition? Well, Again, um, it, you know, I'm go it's going back a ways and I haven't really studied up on it, but she really explored all over the world bloodlines from animals, from uh, little known tribes, little known, you know, indigenous populations and, and other in, in every country and every place in the world. And she, a lot of the spaces are left blank. She looked to find out what was missing in bloodlines as well as what was there. And again, with this, just attention to detail and incredible research. So it's worth exploring uh, the exhibit. It, 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 it's almost, it looks like science. I mean, it's, it's obviously visual and it's obviously artistic, but it's the amount of cataloging um, in detail really is fascinating. Thanks so much, Ellen. All right, we're gonna move on to Peter. Peter, are you ready? 
Yes, uh, uh, Evan and Casey, thank you for including me. Uh, the picture I've chosen to show today is an anonymous uh, snapshot. Uh, I'm a collector of vernacular photography and have been for some time. Uh, this has always been one of my, or was one of my absolute favorite photographs uh, as a subset of what I collect. I like photos that show motion or, or, or occasionally they referred to as blurry, um, which this photo definitely is. Um, I think I bought this in the mid nineties at a flea market, I, I believe here in New York. Um, I, the memory of where this exact photo came from eludes me, but I, it's always been one of my absolute favorites. Uh, and as you can see, it, it's a man riding a bicycle in a little bit of a bleak landscape. I think it's American. Um, the man is obviously wearing a suit and with a pocket square. And uh, I think what appears to be spats are probably white socks. I, I'm not entirely sure of that. But I like vernacular photography because you don't get anything before or after the photograph is taken. So you get you, and since it's not my family or somebody's family, you get to sort of invent the story or in question what happened either just before this picture was taken or immediately thereafter. And part of me thinks that it looks like he's fleeing. I, I wonder why a guy dressed so well in a rural landscape isn't driving a car but he's riding off on a bicycle someplace. And that's, uh, I like the intrigue and the unknown part of, of the story surrounding this particular picture. Um, I think the, the bleak landscape or somewhat bleak landscape adds to the sort of mis mysteriousness of it. It's not a rich autumn harvest season or something like that. It appears to be a, a sort of vacant farm field. Um, but it, this has always, always uh, uh, intrigued me. Um, I, uh, I also like this snapshot because it constantly reminds me that a photograph is something that you can remember or it burns itself into your brain and you don't forget it. I, I think there, it's, it, there, it's, it's harder to forget a photo that has made some impact on you than it is, say, a piece of film. Um, you can really f focus on a photo for a long time mentally. And, uh, and I have definitely focused on this one. Um, other people liked it and uh, about a decade ago, I donated this to the Museum of Modern Art and it's in their permanent photography collection. Thank you, Peter. All right, we're going to open it up to questions. We have one in the chat from Mike. How did you come by this photo, Peter? Yeah, I think this was, I purchased this physically at the flea markets that used to uh, surround both sides of Sixth Avenue in Manhattan uh, in, in the 90, 80s and 90s. 25th Street. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, that was gold mine for a time. Yeah, I miss it. Yeah. Buying things online is not the same. <laughs> not at all. I remember coming across uh, um, multiple, multiple, maybe dozens of shoe boxes full of uh, mug shots. Um, ah. and, and, uh, and just like spending hours sorting through looking for variations and interesting ideas in them. Well, I participated in that rather actively. I, I started buying five pictures on one cold February Saturday, and you know it led to like tens of thousands at this point. <laughs> um, I, I love the contrast between you and Ellen, um, uh, just to show the incredible scope that being a collector can cover. You know, uh, Ellen's piece is is an artist who is incredibly rigorous in her specificity and, and, and spins out, you know, wants to leave no stone unturned about its source and its, and its, and its index and its, and, its, and its background and history. And then you're picking something up where you're celebrating the fact that you can't possibly know any part of that. 
and you're filling it in yourself and yet you're both collectors. So um, I, I think that's great. But that leads to um, Timothy's questions, a uh, uh, question that asks um, that he's interested to hear how you came to collect vernacular uh, if it's both easier to get into flea markets and harder to get serious about. I, I, I stumbled on it. I've always collected art and, and, and photography specifically. And, and it was in the early 90s. I was at the flea market one day and a woman had a bin full of snapshots torn out of family albums. And I bought five. I got home and I said, I don't know why I bought these, but I'm going back next week. And, and I've been going back every week since, um, if not in, in physically uh, online from eBay and dealers and so forth. I mean, it's not hard to start a I at least found it wasn't hard to start a vernacular collection. I'm finding it extremely difficult to stop collecting it. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna move on to uh, Cynthia Cable now. Cynthia, are you there? Here I come, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming and listening to me. Uh, the photo I'm sharing is a Jerry Olsman. It's uh, untitled from 1996. And uh, I'm a photographer myself and a painter. And uh, Jerry Olsman works in a surrealistic uh, way and uh, he brings his surrealism into photographs, uh, as you can see by having uh, his imagery using elements like his trees that are the only floating element in the, uh, uh, the clouds which image the uh, rocks floating. And he does this by using multiple enlargers. And I was um, combining negatives at the time using one enlarger, and I tried replicating his photography uh, by using my own elements. Then I was living up in Rochester, New York, and uh, working and uh, taking courses at visual studies workshops up there. and they had an auction and uh, to benefit them. And this was one that was at the auction and I just had to have it. Uh, it it's meant an awful lot to me really since then. And it's a 15 by 19 silver print. And uh, it's, it's been an inspiration to my own creativity since then. Uh, it references Stonehenge, England. Uh, uh, he uses 20 enlargers. Um, it, it's something I haven't been able to do like he. He continues to work today. Uh, he's in his 80s. He produces as many as 100 images a year. Uh, no two are identical. Uh, he, uh, I work electronically, uh, not with a wet dark room anymore. Um, he, uh, he works, he's down in Gainesville, Florida. Um, just uh, really an inspiration to me. Uh, it, it just tells a lot of stories. Uh, since we've collected this one, my husband and I still collect other photographs. We must have, oh, I don't know, 30, 50 photographs because we go to uh, auctions for schools and uh, continue to, uh, to buy from young photographers, uh, and uh, sometimes I exchange with photographers. We, uh, we just enjoy mostly black and white, even though I tend to work in color. Uh, it just uh, 
collecting is fun. It's just, uh, we've got them all over the house. <laughs> Our kids have them. We've got too many. That's perfect. Thanks, Cynthia. As Evan does say, yes, collecting is fun. <laughs> so if anyone wants to jump in with a question, please do. Well, I'm Cynthia's other half. <clears throat> this picture, uh, in case you hadn't noticed, although it references Stonehenge, it's really not. The yeah. rock across the top has the contours of a nude woman lying on her back if you hadn't noticed it. And uh, that comes as a surprise to a lot of people. In fact, some people take this as an actual photograph of Stonehenge. Yeah, it does. It takes a while for people to realize that this isn't one photograph, uh, that it is multiple images. Uh, so it's kind of fun when people come over and, and take a look at our right. photographs to see. We, we also have, uh, I wanted to say, uh, in reference to Peter Cohen's bike picture, we have an early Lartigue, and it's of a bicycle, uh, one of the bicycle pictures. It looks like it's going two ways, and, and it's also a really, really fun, uh, fun image. Now I'm jealous. <laughs> come over and see it oh, you have to come to Pittsburgh <laughs> it even looks like it was it, like those trees in the back are like an African landscape and then the foreground is could be uh, you know Europe so that to me also is it just uh, the trees don't fit with the rest of the landscape uh, no the individual elements the trees the rocks are I think individually selected and assembled into this picture. Yeah. There is no real place that looks even remote. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, that's problem. why it, that's why I to me you sense that it's a made up place. Yeah, probably even back here. I, I don't know if you can see where I'm the, the, this uh, fence, fence is yeah. probably something that was put in around the uh, around the tree. Uh, I looked uh, at many, many stone uh, uh, upcrops, and I, I think this one is in Northern Scotland. Uh, but it's hard to tell. When you look at photographs online of Stonehenge type uh, assemblages, uh, depends on what angle you're looking at, you, you can't really tell. Um, where he may have photographed it. It's, uh, but it's obviously some place. I mean, those rocks were photographed upright somewhere. Thank you, Cynthia. That's great. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to our next speaker. We've got Ken Chute. Ken, are you there? Oh, uh, yes. Hey, there you are, Ken, great. So you've got your photograph in front of you and, and here it is on the screen. You've got three minutes. Um, uh, the, the photo uh, conveys like to me a, a sense of an America that I can uh, believe in. That, you know, where people work together, where work has a dignity and the, the work is valued. And, this is uh, you know, from 1944, so it, it's uh, uh, in the context of welding during World War II. Uh, and I, it, uh, I found the expressions of the different people in the photo uh, fascinating. And you know, sometimes looking at photos, I <clears throat> feel almost as if I know the people. Uh, even though I really uh, don't, but I would like to know their, their, their stories. Um, yeah, I've collected over the years, so, or gathered photos over the years, so I actually forget where the, this one came from, I, I'm afraid. Uh, probably a secondhand store in uh, California. Uh, the, it, it's by a photo studio, so I, I don't actually know the individual photographer. Um, yeah, generally the, uh, the photos that I gather are from secondhand sources. They, they can cost as little as like 25 cents. They're 
oftentimes in, in, in endangered. Um, I, I gather photos of people I'd like to meet and places I'd like to go and visual experiences that I would you know, like to have. Um, yeah, there used to be, it was painted over, but in San Pedro, California, there was a mural with words something like, uh, uh, keep nationwide freshness alive. So I, I like to look for photos that, that have a, a, a freshness. And uh, yeah, a, a friend uh, studied with the uh, Chicago-based uh, Pilcher, Pilitzer Prize winning photographer, John White, uh, and he said something like that, that in photography, you don't take photos, you are given photos. So I, I regard the photos that have come my way as, as gifts, a heritage I, I hope to pass along. Um, yeah, like the photos I have of, of people could easily be a book called uh, Friends I Never Met. Um, what we see depends on what we have seen. Uh, I keep trying to expand my visual experience and I, I enjoy the, the searching and the sense of discovery. Uh, but yeah, the, the, thank you to, to everyone here and yeah, to, to Casey and to Evan. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, Natalie just jumped in with a comment about how uh, it's a good reminder that photographs can be visual information and she feels like this one holds a lot of stories. If anyone else wants to jump in with a question or comment, feel free. And it's Peter. I, I think this is a fabulous photograph. Congratulations for spotting it and, and rescuing it. I, I love the fact that all the guys have hats and none of the women. The women, a couple bushkas or, or whatever you call that uh, scarf thing, but it, it, it's, it's just a fantastic picture of the time. So Ken, you, you, you talked about, you no, um, uh, I, you talked about um, that it's places you wish you could go and people that you wish you could meet or know better. So if we saw all of the images that you've collected in a book or in an album or something, would it be a kind of virtual uh, personal album uh, that represents uh, your, your, your kind of second life to go back, you know, is this your analog way of creating a kind of second life? Uh, well, yeah, I, I have photos from places from like the, the River Jordan to like New York City during a certain period of time that's, you know, the city's changed. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, you know, many faces, many people. Uh, uh, I, I think my, my basic feeling is that uh, art itself is oftentimes, uh, yeah, over the years, it's sometimes lost. I mean, all, all the great poems don't make it into books. All the great art doesn't make it into museums. So I, I think my basic interest is to uh, try to hold on to what's out there and hopefully pass it along in some way, maybe an archive or you know, whatever form it might take. And, and then just to um, clarify here, Mark ha or Mike in the chat has a question that this is a wartime factory work crew, right? Oh, uh, well, I see these welding glasses. So I'm just assuming that they're you know, doing welding during the war. And, and one can see sort of you know, chalk marks and stuff. So I think it's a picture taken right there at work. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. We're going to move over to Steve Schlick. Steve, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. Steve, thank, you. thank you for this opportunity for everything that you do, the photo fair. Um, so this photograph is by the American photographer Todd Heido. Um, I purchased this at a Silver Eye benefit auction in the 1990s. And at that time, um, Heido's work was strictly black and white, and he used a variety of medium medium format camera, so one of which was a plastic lens Holga, the larger format negative, or I forget that's a, what, what exactly that is, but larger than 35 millimeter. But one of the attributes of the, uh, the Holga was it's vignetting because the lens is so cheap that you get a really nice vignette effect on it. Now, I don't think this 
photograph was taken with that. But the thing was with his work at that time, everything that he did was printed, same format, four by five inches. Um, and it sort of gave a really seamless flow when presented. Um, work sort of has a, what a, generally an ethereal property, a lot of fogginess or, or light, um, you know, not, not straight on photographs a lot of times. So, um, and I got to know him a bit and he just, one of these people, really up and coming photographers who just shot all the time. Um, just consistently taking photographs and it just showed me the importance of finding your own voice in photography by continually shooting, printing, curating, and displaying your own work. Just to find your own voice and, 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 and do it in a consistent format. And I was fortunate enough at that time, um, the Silver Eye, he did a photo workshop where he came in on a Saturday and everyone got a plastic Polga and one roll of film. And he showed us some of his work and we got a little bit of instruction and went out for a day of shooting. And so 12 images, 12 images, so not like today when you can take as many as you want in a digital camera and, you know, really forced you to, to pick your shot well. And um, it was nice, you know, at that time you didn't really have a lot of in-camera in effects, of course. I took the roll of film at the end of the day and got the next day. But um, it, uh, it really interesting, a um, little exercise there. And um, so they had that connection. And then later, uh, Heidos moved on to larger. Uh, scale color prints, and particularly he did a series called House Hunting, which is an aperture book. And um, and sort of what I, one thing I like, and if you haven't seen it, basically it's nighttime portraits of houses that he comes across. Um, again, in fog, maybe there's one window illuminated, which um, I thought about this when I, I looked at this again, I realized this is sort of the obverse of his current work. Um, most of the pictures you see now, it's a house with one window illuminated, but this, it's the, the opposite viewpoint of one person in front of an illuminated window. So um, on a personal level, as, as collecting, I've sort of collected sporadically over time, but um, I collected quite a few photographs and also printed a lot um, during my early adulthood. And at one point I realized that all the photography, photographs in my collection were dark in some respect or another. They're all either black, or, black and white or lacking in color, or they're shot at night, or they lack the human form, or in one way or another, were less than cheerful. And I, I realized that at a time that it, I think my collection was sort of uh, reflective of my general mood at that time. And um, it was sort of reflected in a uniformly somber collection of photographs. So I, I think that goes for anyone. It's, it's gonna be a reflection of your personality, but um, it just sort of came across that. But I think in comparison with uh, most of the, my photographs in my collection from that period of time, this one um, is relatively cheerful. Um, there's an actual person in the frame um, although the subject is faceless, and in spite of the sparseness of the room, there is light streaming through the window, illuminating the space and filling it with hope. I've always displayed this photograph in my bedroom, and I sometimes glance at it in the morning and find inspiration for a fresh new day. So that's my photograph. Thanks, Steve. Fred says that's a great example, early example of Todd's work, and you can see the connection to the work he's doing today. Sure. Um, if anybody else wants to jump in with a question, please do. Or you can throw in another comment or question in the chat. Marjorie says, thank you for bringing that. And also earlier, super early Todd. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, this is one of those fortunate things in life. I just, through friends, through common friends, I got to know him a bit and he just, um, but I've told my kids, you know, anything, I, I sort of use them as inspiration. Sometimes you really got to get off your butt and just, if you really want to get good at something, what they say, 10,000 hours or something, he's probably put 100,000. I listened to a podcast of him recently and he says he's methodically categorized, cataloged all of his photographs from when he started. And he thinks he's printed and displayed about 2% of them. So wow. and anyone who's worked, you know, shooting photographs and printing them and displaying, that's, that's, uh, that. Um, do I have some of his other images? If you look at Aperture, um, you look at House Hunting. That's his, that's his primary work. Um, if you have a first edition of that, you're in good shape. Um, but he displays a lot. Um, let's say, why, why he went in another direction? I don't know. You know, he went, I've, I sort of lost track of him for a while. He studied in the East Coast. He grew up in Ohio, studied in the East Coast. And then he moved to um, San Francisco and studied under Larry Sultan. And I think then he started finding, you know, a different voice. And just, um, there's, there's a really good podcast recently. If you can look it up, I forget the person who's hosting it, but um, 
you can find more about it there and lots online. Thank you, Steve. That's great. Uh, okay. Just for amusement, here's a Holga camera. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. That's awesome. <laughs> you, can get, you can get a 35 millimeter at the Warhol, too, which is nice because it's tough to get you know larger format developed and scanned or whatever these days. But yeah, they're, they're fun to play around with, definitely. Great. We're going to move on to our last collector, Tim Jives. Tim, are you here? Hello. Hi there. Good evening. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, Evan, uh, for the opportunity. Um, listening to everyone talk, I'm reminded that I am very early in the collecting bug stage. Uh, but so much of what I'm hearing uh, from the folks who went before makes me think I may be in for a, a similar road where you don't know what got you started, but um, there will be budgets in the future to try to keep up with this habit because um, this is a picture um, by Stephen Mallon that I think I thought about for probably a good two or three years before I actually purchased it. Um, Stephen and I went back and forth. I went back and forth with his gallery, which at the time was in Brooklyn, and now I've learned is uh, moved on to uh, the Lower East Side because Brooklyn got too expensive. So it's back to the Lower East Side. Um, but uh, this is a picture uh, from a series called Last Stop uh, Atlantic. Uh, and he's a documentary photographer who does a lot of work with industry and sort of large scale, you know, architecture and factories and machines and things, you know, the size of subway cars. And this is a project where he followed uh, the MTA, uh, which was the organization kind of in charge of running the subways. Um, and they went through a, a years long process of what to do with these aging subway cars that were, you know, this is like one of those old Ironbird ones that I, I think was probably on its way out 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And what they decided was they were going to rehome these uh, off the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and so the the cars were stripped of every possible non fish coral friendly thing uh, and loaded up onto these giant barges uh, and hauled off uh, off the coast of the Atlantic near uh, I believe New Jersey or or New York uh, and they were dumped out there and and are now years later home to Lots of sea creatures, hopefully. But uh, Stephen documented the process from start to finish. And this image was not the first one uh, that sort of stuck with me, but um, the one that I ended up purchasing after talking with them, you know, for a long time, just because there were there were so many that were just um, otherworldly. You know, you have these gigantic, you know, size of a city bus hunks of metal that were making a voyage out to the ocean you know, massive in their own right, but then against the backdrop of these barges holding dozens of these, and against the, the other backdrop of the Atlantic Ocean, you know, in which they seemed kind of minuscule. So uh, I had just moved to Pittsburgh from New York City um, and was pretty nostalgic, I think, at the time. So it's as much about New York and a time and a place uh, that uh, I sort of moved on from as anything else. But uh, it was just a, an interesting intro to how you could get to know an artist a little bit, uh, especially somebody, you know, not necessarily as established as some of the other names that folks talked about today, but um, artists earlier in their careers are eager to have some friends and some, some supporters, even if they don't pull the trigger right away. So um, this is in my dining room here in Pittsburgh, uh, you know, years after uh, they sunk to the bottom of the ocean. So thanks. Thank you, Tim. That's great. If anybody wants to jump in with a question, you're welcome to. What's the image behind you, Tim? Uh, the image behind me, that is uh, from a Silver Eye auction, not too long ago, um, and I'm blanking on his name right now. My goodness, help me out, Casey. Ross Mantle. <laughs> Ross Mantle, thank you. <laughs> another another example of, uh, you know, somebody who I've just stayed in touch with over the years, and it sort of became, this needs to happen. So uh, this was from his uh, Misplaced Fortune series, uh, which was downtown. Um, and actually, both of these pictures, you know, they got stuck in my head and then the ability to see them went away both because of the pandemic 
and because I'd moved to Pittsburgh. And so a picture that kind of stuck with me, um, you know, sooner or later you, you find a way to budget for it. So it's what I, this was a, a lucky auction thing, helping a super organization. So it was a little cheaper than it might've been otherwise, but Steven, Stevens was saved for, for a little while. So I wanted to just say something a little off track here, but I don't know if there's any other Los Angeles people on this call, but you know, LACMA is being completely remodeled. And one of the uh, things in the proposal was to hang this large Jeff Koontz in front of the museum, which is a train car. And it was, would come out from the top and hang down over Wilshire Boulevard. <laughs> and it's actually, I think it still may be in the proposal. They're having a lot of trouble raising all the money, but indeed they have started the remodel. So maybe when you all come out to the West Coast in a couple of years, you'll see something that looks just like this uh, hanging right in the middle of the city. You can see the, um, the image on the draw, you know, the architectural drawings of the museum. They have the, the uh, proposal of what it would look like when the, when the Coons was installed. Crazy. I'll give a little shout out to uh, Marjorie here. Forgive me, Tim, it, it won't take from your time. Um, uh, this whole uh, event is a wholesale steal from Marjorie's organization, which is Photographic Arts Council LA. Um, those of you who have come to our other um, events may remember Michael um, talking about, Michael Hawley talking about uh, PAC LA. And like us, or we like them is probably more accurate, um, have um, created really a robust uh, virtual and Zoom um, program, and I, and especially in this decentralized time where where being in one place or another is no impediment to being a part of these things, I encourage you to check out their their content because it's 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 really remarkable. Thank you, Evan, and kudos to you and, and Casey. Well done, super well done, everybody. Thank you. Other questions for Tim. And I think I'm going to stop sharing the image. If you all want to jump in um, with questions for Tim or questions for any of the collectors, now is a great time. Uh, we've got a few more minutes before we have to close up shop. I am struck by how many of the different ways one can approach this we covered with just a few of us. Um, whether it's fine art or vernacular or process or knowing the artist or not knowing the artist or something that spurred you through some sort of personal quest. I mean, those are just a, a, a few ways that one can find your way into both photography and collecting. Um, so I'm curious, either from our, from our, our panel or even from, um, from from uh, the audience uh, to to talk a little bit about you know what does draw you into a piece that that uh, that that kind of gets that 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 idea started. Or nothing. I'll I'll just uh, chime in. Uh, you know, Laura and I have been collecting. I don't know since the early '90s and. Uh, um, and without, you know, without a plan. Um, but, you know, somehow uh, your own sensibility, you know, over time colors the whole collection. So, you know, I couldn't point to one thing, but, you know, now many years later and hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, photos later, you know, there is a theme, you know, and it's a reflection of your interests, um, you know, your emotional sensibility. I think someone here said, you know, their collection was all dark for a while because that was their mood. Well, yeah, that's totally an issue. That can totally be an influence. Uh, um, and of course, your own ideas. Uh, what I love about photography is that it's open to all of those things. Uh, uh, there's so there's so much rich variety in photography, and uh, um, in fact, I think it's a little hard to find any art these days that doesn't have the influence of photography in it in some way. 
and that's why I think it's, you know, we just keep coming back to photography as our love in collecting. Uh, as much as I like painting and sculpture and video and all of the rest, uh, 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 nothing quite does it for me like photography. Uh, my comments in chat uh, in, uh, in a way that I think um, uh, I've seen art generally defined, uh, you know, I, I, there's, there's a kind of glib definition of art is that it's something that makes you look in the, at the world in a different way. And Mike says something about the work that makes me see things in a way. And uh, I mean, it, it, it can't be any more simple or complex than that, right? Well, in the absence of... Something that makes you just look twice, uh, that you turn around and, and go back to the photograph, that you can't escape it. Uh, and then when you have two people in the family uh, collecting, sometimes one of us will be more drawn towards one picture than the other, and then it comes home and... Uh, it, it gnaws at both of us. It, uh, it, it's a very interesting process. What, I, I wanted to say one thing. What, uh, what I don't understand sometimes when I, uh, with a lot of new people when we moved here, and you visit sometimes other people's houses or when you did, which you don't anymore, uh, and they don't have anything. Uh, or they'll go to... Uh, Target or they'll go to um, Bed Bath and & Beyond and, and buy art there uh, in, instead of even blowing up family uh, snapshots or pictures that they happen to choose. I, I still don't see and I try and encourage just find something that you love rather than just pick somebody else's love. Uh, but it's hard to encourage people to get over their own inhibitions in collecting. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, make a John Waters uh, quote somewhat family friendly. Um, uh, he, he said uh, that if you go to someone's house um, and they don't have any books, um, leave. And, and so perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, that the same can be said for, for, for art as well. Um, uh, Marjorie, we're, you're on mute, so we're not hearing you. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. Yeah, yeah. It was, if you're going to somebody's house for a very particular purpose. Um, you go to somebody's house and they don't have any books, don't sleep with them. Yeah, sleep is not the verb, but... Uh, Which is really what he's saying is like... <laughs> <laughs> not I'm, also, I'm also always fascinated by people that buy their art at, at um, you know, Pier 1 or Ikea. But, you know, hell, thank goodness for those kind of posters. They have not, I mean, it's, it's not a collecting thing. Collecting costs money and a taste and trust in one's own eye and all those things. So... I kind of am pleased that places like those mass market stores offer posters and ways to bring a little history, color, concept, whatever, into one's home. So, but you do know something about them, I guess, if you go and that's what they've got versus a collection. And who knows, maybe in 50 years, uh, there'll be a retrospective at MoMA of the, uh, of the, the Prince of Ikea, 2005 to 2020. <laughs> um, so uh, Cynthia um, touches on an interesting uh, dynamic, which maybe is an idea for a future talk, which is the collector couple. Um, Fred touched on it as well, um, and there are so many different ways to approach that. There's, there's, you know, you both have to agree or you take turns who gets to pick or there's just so many different. So maybe we'll, we'll structure a, 
uh, a talk in the future about co uh, collector couples and how they come to terms with their with their with especially their differences the differences is what makes it interesting right not the ones that they both just instantly love and say yeah we'll get that it's the it's the fights that make it interesting um absolutely <laughs> absolutely says Fred. <laughs> yeah. Where, where's laura fred um, <laughs> Um, uh, He's putting uh, photos through the shredder right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I think I, I think I hear Plexi hitting the sidewalks <laughs> before below. But uh, um, yeah, yeah, it, it, it could be interesting. Um, Casey, should we wrap up? Yeah, I think it's about that time. Um, <laughs> we want to say thank you to all the collectors who joined us tonight, and of course, you guys, the audience. Thanks for jumping in with us. Um, we are, like Evan said, wrapping up for the year, but we'll certainly have more programming next year. So if you're um, not on our email list, uh, sign up or follow us on social media to see what we're up to. We, um, we also want to say thanks to the Hillman Foundation, the William T. Hillman Foundation, for uh, providing support for our programming this year.